Uh -huh. My name is Elaine Gallant, and I'm with Books, 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 a live streaming series through Think Tech Hawaii on Oahu. Here's where we're going to talk about books, everything from reading them to writing them and everything in between. I have a very special guest today, and of course I say that every time, but today I really, 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 really mean it. I have Alexander Ali Silvert, the federal defense attorney uh, here in, Ho well, retired now, and uh, welcome. Oh, thank you. Aloha. Aloha to you too. Let me tell you a little bit about Ali. He was raised in New York City and Vermont. He was schooled in UCLA, New York University, and Boston College Law School, where he obtained his Juris Doctor degree in 1984. He worked as a state and federal public defender in Philadelphia before moving to Honolulu in 1989 with his wife and three-week-old son to work at the Hawaii Federal Public Defender's Office. He served as first assistant federal public defender from 1992 until his retirement in October of 2020. Congratulations on that. In 2000, he was one of several public defenders, to federal public defenders, to be named Federal Defender of the Year by the National Association of Federal Defenders. He currently lectures at the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law and runs his own private federal criminal law consulting firm in Hawaii. My advice to you, he's the man you want on your side. You find yourself in federal trouble. <laughs> Ali. <laughs> I always tell people if, if, you, if you see me, you're in trouble. <laughs> oh, well, I would be hopeful if I saw you. You've written a book. And I have to say, it's a very exciting book. And I really encourage people to read it. It's called The Mailbox Conspiracy. And this is a case that happened before the bigger one that took over all of Honolulu. Well, and all of Hawaii, too, because we were all glued to the set, uh, uh, trying to understand what was happening. Uh, how did people that we trusted so much for our safety and everything how did they fail us? So why don't you tell us briefly about the mailbox case and then how it bled into the chief of police and the state, the third rank state prosecutor? So this book is about uh, Gerard Puana and our investigation in his case, in his defense, which ultimately led to the uncovering of the evidence of, of Chief Louis Kailoa and his wife, Catherine Kailoa, and how they framed him for a crime that he did not commit. So way back in 2013, Gerard Puana was arrested for allegedly stealing the mailbox belonging to Catherine Kailoa and Chief Louis Kailoa. And I was appointed to represent him in federal court on the charge of destruction and stealing of a mailbox, because a mailbox is a federal object and the stealing of it is a federal crime. So what this book recounts is our investigation in his defense, which led us to uncovering all of the evidence that he had been framed, framed by Louis Kailoa, framed by Catherine Kailoa, and framed by a number of secretive police officers of the CIU unit, which all is a kind of a black ops police unit within HPD that reports to and works for the chief. So the entire story in the, in the first part of the book is all about that investigation. And even though we all know in the end who did it, uh, and then he was framed, I walk you through everything we uncovered as if it's a whodunit as if it's like a murder mystery. Yes, and I have to say you've done a very good job with that too, because I didn't know, I mean, you know, when, when a case is going on, you don't hear a lot of evidence. You don't hear a lot of prior actions that are being held against someone or are pending on someone. So you don't get to hear about all of that and how it affects it, the case that's currently uh, in operation that are being tried. So. He, he, why take this case? It's a mailbox is stolen. What? Come on. Right. Come on, a mailbox. <laughs> what made you, what was so intriguing about this case that made you take a, a mailbox case? So as first assistant in the office, I'm the person who gets all the cases coming in and I assign the cases. And I took the case 
exactly because I had the same reaction that you just had. What the heck is a mailbox case doing in federal court? And when this case came in and I had been a federal attorney for many, many years by that point, I was like, wait a second, what is this? This is very unusual. And, you know, in our business, we do the same types of cases over and over and over again, drug cases, bank robberies, Ponzi schemes. When this came in, I had that same reaction. I was like, wow, this is strange and odd. And when I found out that it, the mailbox that was stolen belonged to the chief of police and his prosecutor wife, I was like, well, this is intriguing. So I assigned the case to myself. Okay, so the plot thickened when it became the chief of police, I imagine. But um, Gerard is sitting in front of you and you admit, you admit in your novel that you weren't really sure about him. He's a, he's a little nervous, he's spilling the beans, he's talking fast, he's, he's giving you way more than you're asking for, you're trying to slow him down, you're trying to decide what is all of this really about? Yeah, many, you know, as a longtime criminal defense attorney, I have many, many clients who come in and give me a story that they want me to believe in or say they're completely innocent uh, when the evidence is overwhelming. So I'm kind of used to defendants coming in and not really telling me the truth. Um, and Gerard kind of came in and told me this bizarre story of why he didn't do it and why he was being framed. And it was, it was very unbelievable in the beginning. And it took a while for him to win me over, even though I'm his defense attorney, to really understand and appreciate what really was going on. Right, because you have handled two cases that uh, were near death penalty cases as well. So you're not, you're not, you don't shy away from the bigger cases and, you know. So. No, I, I, I've handled some very big cases in Hawaii. Uh, a, a mailbox case would not be considered one of them, uh, but it turned out to be the most important case I've ever handled. Isn't that something? I mean, the mailbox was the pivotal piece that uh, went on to expose something much greater. So um, it also was the result of Catherine. K. Aloha, who was the granddaughter of Florence, the niece of Gerard, right? Florence tried to buy Gerard a condo. So she would have to refinance her house in order to do that. And then Catherine took power of attorney and, and then it went downhill from there. Now, Florence and Gerard eventually filed a civil case against Catherine, but she won. How did she, I, I do not understand how she could win this and be awarded six hundred thousand dollars. Right. The, the stunning uh, event in this whole bizarre, twisted case is the Puanas had filed a civil lawsuit in state court against Catherine Kaloa, claiming that she had stole all this money from them improperly, and then we believe, you know, Catherine had framed Gerard in our criminal case in order to get him convicted of a felony offense to help her win the civil case. Because if you have a felony conviction for a case like this, you could, that could be used to impeach your credibility as a witness. And she would then be able to destroy Gerard's Puana credibility at the civil case, which she desperately needed to win. And what happened was, as people know, in December of 2014, we had a mistrial because Louis Kaloa blurted out something improper in court during his testimony. But the civil case went on in state court. And in February of 2015, Catherine took, takes the stand in the civil case, apparently lies throughout her entire testimony and convinces the jury that she's telling the truth and she wins. Not only do the Puanas lose their lawsuit, the jury actually awards punitive damage to Catherine Kaloa and the Puanas are ordered to pay over $600,000 in damages to Catherine for impugning, impugning her integrity. I know. That, is so, that was so shocking to me. It, it really was. I mean, and, and like I said, these are things that you don't learn about when you get into the bigger case, because you, I, I don't think you could bring them in. Is that correct? You couldn't bring this information in. Right. Uh, for the case, that, in my case, it wouldn't be relevant. Um, but then we know that Subsequently, what happened was the FBI gets involved, uh, the special prosecutor gets involved, and they charge Louis and Catherine Kaloa with using their official positions to frame an innocent man. 
And uh, that's what, in the end, exonerated Gerard, cleared Florence's name, and got the civil suit reversed. So they never had to pay the money. The sad part is, while the civil suit was reversed and the Puanas didn't have to pay that money uh, to Catherine, they never won the civil suit. They never got Catherine to pay her them back for the money she had stolen from them. Yes, so they're out the money. Gerard is being charged with stealing this mailbox. Can we see a picture of the mailbox? This would be the Kay Aloha's mailbox at their home. There's the mailbox. And you were very instrumental here when it came to this mailbox. And I, and for the, for the sake of the book, I kind of don't want to talk about the wonderful thing that you did with this mailbox. I want people to read the book. I really do because it is it, it, it what I what I especially loved about it is how you were able to break everything down and not put it in such legal ease that for those of us who are lay people we can understand and follow it thoroughly because there are there are, are petitions going back and forth and civil cases going back and forth and you know all this traffic happening that it's it would be hard to uh, follow it if you hadn't have written this book in plain English to us to understand what uh, that, that untangles the whole mess. Because Catherine apparently really had her hands in a lot of things, right? In p other people's lives and the way she could manipulate and get people to trust her and to do some bidding for her, right? Absolutely. We uncovered a whole lot bunch of different pieces of evidence about Catherine that never actually made it into the trial or wouldn't have but little threads of different things that she was involved in and she had her fingers in a lot of different things and mostly improperly um so it it, it was a, a mess and what we tried you know what i tried very hard to do in this book because there is a lot of legal concepts uh, throughout the book is explain it in lay English so that anybody could understand. And that's actually something I worked very hard at in the book so that anyone could read it. And I, I think it does read very well in, when it comes to legal parts. You'll learn a lot about law. You'll learn a lot about defense strategy and how we prep for witnesses and how we subpoena things. But I think it's broken down in a simple way. To, and it actually makes it a lot of fun to read. Yes, and I, and I actually think that because I'm, I'm facing a, a a case myself, not that I did anything, but I'm, I'm having to, I'm on the victim end of it. And, and of course, the courtroom scares me to death. So even reading this gives me some reassurances as well. You know, I, I get a little bit of insight of how the court operates, because we don't spend days in, in the courtroom as, as regular people. <laughs> you know, it, we just don't. And it's a foreign place, and it can be frightening and um, bigger, than, bigger than you can imagine. So especially when, you know, depending on the situation of the case. So I read it from uh, that viewpoint of having to walk into a courtroom myself someday soon. And also because I followed this case, you know, it was on the news nightly and a lot of people did. So thank you for writing. I think you did a really good job of it. I, I do have some questions for you. Um, I'm trying to move down real quick. Well, we've already answered that one, so I can't ask that one. Um, the federal case is continuing. The federal case happened. So tell me how this case of the mailbox led into the federal case against the Kealohas. Well, so far, what we've seen is, uh, you know, Mr. Wheat, who's a special prosecutor from Washington, uh, from Sa San Diego, California, who was appointed by the United States Attorney General, came in to investigate. He spent two years investigating the Kailoas before he charged them, and that was in 2017. And then another two years before that case went to trial, and it's the Kailoa case that everybody knows about because by then everybody was paying attention. Um, it was the Puana case that kind of set that up. Um, so as we all know, they were eventually convicted, but that investigation by Mr. Wheat led to now uh, further charges against uh, 
Catherine Kalo's brother, Dr. Puana, which is on trial right now in federal court. It also has read, led to the indictments against uh, Donna Leong and Roy Amamiya and Max Sword, which is still pending. Uh, and it appears that the grand jury is still going on and that there are other people uh, who probably will be indicted in the near future, high up in the Honolulu government. So this is a, a situation where uh, the initial spark to get that grand jury going has really uncovered a whole series of things that have yet to come out. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, uh, it's always the cover up. You know, we all talk about, you know, the cover up and we've seen it in national politics. We've seen it in Watergate. We've seen it in other big events. It's the cover up. And it, it, it seems to be the same thing that's happening here is, you know, even if you didn't commit a crime, if you're questioned about it and you lie about it to cover up what you think you may have done wrong, then that's a crime in itself. And so we're kind of seeing that unfold in these charges that have been coming up. Right. Now, um, Leong, I think, was just in the news last week, right, where over the $250,000 that Chief Louis K. Aloha was awarded when he retired. So can you talk about that? Well, I don't have firsthand information about that, but what we do know, of course, publicly is uh, when, all, when all this came out, I had been calling for reform, you know, after the mistrial, you know, for the police commission to be reformed, for the city and county government to take action, uh, for there to be more accountability and more transparency in government. And the police commission did every, anything but that at that point. They didn't want to hear the evidence that we had. They didn't want to really look into it. Mr. Wheat began to look into it, and he believes that, through the charging document, that the $250,000 that was paid to Chief Kalo to get him to retire uh, was improper in some manner, illegal in some manner, and he's charged that. Uh, so that's what that case is about. It's not directly about the Puana case, but it is an outgrowth of it because the city and county wanted to get rid of Chief Kalo, and they paid him to leave. Correct. I have a viewer question here that's very interesting. How did the city of Honolulu allow the Kealohas to get away with all of this without anyone questioning? People talk. The buck begins at the top. You know, my book, in the second part of the book, I do discuss the failure of the city and county of Honolulu various oversight agencies to have stopped this because this was preventable. Um, and many agencies, oversight agencies in city and county government didn't do its job, looked the other way. And unfortunately, many lawyers who had information, who knew what was going on in terms of different aspects of Catherine Kailoa's uh, life, wouldn't report her. They were afraid to, to tell on her or other officers beneath uh, Louis Kalo didn't want to say anything. So it really was an atmosphere where for many years, nobody would say anything. And unfortunately, and I again write about this in the book, you know, we had an opportunity after the Kalos were indicted and after they were convicted and sentenced to make changes, to make real changes in government. And I think we missed to a great extent that chance. Yes, well, Catherine K. Aloha was quite powerful herself as a state prosecutor under Kaneshiro. So, you know, she had her hands in pretty far as well, right? Yeah, I mean, for myself, I think this whole, the whole mailbox frame up was orchestrated by her. I think it was much more orchestrated by her than by Louis Kailoa. I do believe once Louis Kailoa found out about it, he was all in to cover it up and to protect his wife and to protect his officers. But it was really Catherine. And yes, her fingers uh, are all over this and uh, they're all over a lot of different things as well. And she, she did what she could from her side and with people that she knew. And he did things with people on his side to frame Gerard and try to get him responsible for all of this. Another question is what about the police commission and the county council? They know well, that know. again goes to the $250,000 payoff. And, you know, as Loretta Sheehan, who was a uh, police commissioner at the time, uh, tried, you know, she was saying we shouldn't pay him off and let him retire in good standing. We should just fire him. 
Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that was not done. And so there's this interplay going on between the police commission, many of who are doing the bidding of the city and county administration and city council, which was trying to get involved, but was basically brushed off. Okay, there was a huge fallout from all of this, huge fallout, starting with Catherine K. Aloha and Chief, Police Chief Lewis K. Aloha. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to get to, down to, I have all your, I wrote down your chronological, and I didn't write it down, I printed it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, the book alone is worth just having for the, the back part of it uh, to see how everything panned out here because the sentences were very interesting. Uh, Catherine is remanded into custody. Okay, I'm still not there. It's, it's pretty amazing. Well, maybe you remember. Oh, here it is. Catherine KLO was sentenced to 13 years in prison, correct? That's correct. Louis KLO had to seven. Why was it so much less, do you think? Well, so this is a little difficult to explain, but so in, in federal court, we have statutes. Statutes are written by Congress that tell us what the crime is. And it can, so for example, bank robbery, you could get up to 20 years in prison, but the judge can give you anything. The judge can give you probation, a day in jail, a year in jail, anything up to 20 years. We then have these very complicated sentencing guidelines which are tell a judge, you know, a much more narrow range of what the sentence should be. And in this case, what happened was, unfortunately, the jury had different means and manners of a conspiracy to decide what these people had done, what, what conspiracy had they committed. And the jury checked off obstruction of justice, not civil rights violation. And as a result of that, the guidelines were actually lower than they should have been because a civil rights violation is a much worse offense than just obstruction of justice. And it wasn't the jury's fault. They just weren't instructed correctly and didn't understand what they were supposed to do or could do. And as a result of that, when the judge went to sentencing, the guidelines that were before him were lower than they could have been. So actually under those guidelines, the KLO has got hit hard at the top of the guidelines. So it was a severe sentence. Okay, if we could see the graphic with the police tree, where it shows all of the people involved on, uh, this is on the Kealoha side on the left and the Kuana people on the right, is that correct? As far as I can see. That, that's correct. Um, on the right, you had two police officers who agreed to cooperate uh, against the Kealoha's and the other defendants. And both of those in police officers had already pled guilty. Okay. And the other ones received various forms of uh, punishment and jail time or probation? That's correct. Uh, almost everybody in the case got jail time. All of the people uh, who were under the defendants list got jail time. Um, Mr. Sellers did not. Uh, Mr. Silva got a few months. Yes. Okay. Well, the case goes on. So are you going to write a second book? I have a title for you. <laughs> well, what's the title? I'm always open to suggestions. <laughs> Mailbox Conspiracy Part 2 Postmarks. <laughs> postmarks from the beyond. Right? Yes, there you go. Because people are still having, I mean, the, the case is, cases are still happening and it's still very much um still very much out there and this ended what year this ended in 2021 about then your book your book ends at, in september of 2021 that's right. correct after all the sentences after all and, and uh, you had to testify for what three days in this oh no, no i testified just for five hours in the Kaloa case felt like three days um <laughs> and, and you know when you were talking about you know, help you through, you know, understanding federal court and your experience that you're going through. When I testified in this case for the prosecution against the KLOs, that was the first time I ever testified in a criminal trial because I'm a defense lawyer. I'm always the one cross-examining witnesses, but I'm not one who testifies. So that was my first time ever turning around, facing the courtroom and testifying. So there was a unique experience for me, so in the book, I kind of relay what that feeling was like for every what, what it's like to be a witness. 
Yes. Well, I'm happy to say we were not able to cover everything in the book. <laughs> I'm really happy to say that because I really endorse this 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 book. I think I think everyone should read it. It's it, you know it's a local uh, situation, and um, and it's ongoing. Everybody should be informed about it. Um, so tell us what's ahead for you. You're going. You're now retired. You're going. You're going into authorship. You you have one novel under. I mean, I I have two myself. So I know how much hard work this is. <laughs> I know how much hard work this is. So what's on your agenda? Well, I am I am teaching at the law school, so I'm uh, I'm enjoying that. I'm teaching a trial advocacy course, so it's a lot of fun. Um, I do have a small consulting uh, firm of my own, and I am looking forward to writing more books. It may not necessarily be on cases, although I have several cases I could write about, but uh, I am looking forward to writing more books. Yes, and, and you, you know, you say you have other cases you could write about. I'm, that was one of the questions I originally had in my head going into this was, why write about this one, you know? Yeah, you know, this is one of those cases where if it wasn't true, you wouldn't believe it because it's so odd. The twists and turns are so unbelievable that it's just amazing that this really happened. Uh, so writing the book, as I once said to somebody, it was it, it was easy to write in the sense that it was all true. So I was just recounting things that had happened, but trying to make it interesting and learning how to write and learning how to grab readers and learning how to make the law easy to understand was really the hard part of the book. But the facts in the book and what happened are bizarre they're almost keystone copish but it's all true yes and and i i'll i'll vouch for that because i read it i'm a, I'm a voracious reader and i read this i slowed way down to read this because of i was going to be conducting the interview but i could not put it down well thank I really you could not put it down so well done kudos and all of that we have just uh, under a minute left. And I do want to thank you for being on the show, Ali, Books, Books, Books. And uh, we, we so totally appreciate that you've written this, this wonderful novel for everyone. I'd like to thank also the studio, the technicians, the staff, Jay Fidel, our producer, our underwriters, where would we be without you? And also our viewers. Uh, we can't thank you enough. You can find my work on Amazon, or you can look at my blog, elainegallantblog.wordpress.com. And that's all we have for today. Ali, thank you so much. You're welcome. And much success to you. All right. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.